Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. Yep, is it on? Yep, good, thank you. So we've spent the day in graduation ceremonies making sure microphones work um, in a rather large marquee, which we're very proud of at the moment, if you haven't seen it. Um, it's great to see you all here today, um, not least because it's fantastic to start doing face-to-face -face events in, in this way, recognising that COVID very definitely hasn't gone away, and we certainly have one or two people who I know would have loved to have been here this evening who have not been able to um, because of that. Um, this, this week is in no small part, um, well, in the main, to be honest, if John, Jonathan just shuts his ears, about celebrating the degree awards of four and a half thousand students because we're doing our catch-up degree ceremonies. Um, and they really have waited a long time for that celebration and hopefully we're doing them proud by what we're doing. But we are taking the opportunity this week also to, to celebrate the 10 years that Jonathan has been the Chancellor of this university, 10 in a bit years. Um, we owe him a lot um, and I will in fact embarrass him with a few of those things tomorrow evening when I have a, a, uh, a different talk to give uh, in terms of that, that celebration because I think tonight it's actually appropriate that it's not really about Kiel, it's around Jonathan's influence in the, the broader world and that's what we're going to do. So celebrating his achievements as, a, as an author, a campaigner, a broadcaster or to be honest any other medium he can possibly find in order to um, put out the message around the severe problems we have around the climate and broader sustainability. And he's been doing that for over 40, 40 years. And as I say, using all of those things and, and talking over those 40 years for something that was looming, but that now I think um, we all absolutely agree we're absolutely in the middle of and that it's hitting us with some vengeance. I've just been talking to someone outside who's been talking about how his house has been flooded, for example, uh, over, over the last few, few months. So Jonathan has been involved in environmental issues since the early 1970s in all sorts of different ways. Having started his time as a, a teacher, he then moved into um, a whole range of different ac activities. And if I was to stand and summarize all of those, then you'd be spending all evening listening to me rather than him. And that's absolutely not what you've come here to, to do. So I'm not gonna do that. But he did start in teaching, then moved to be director of Friends of the Earth before founding um, the Forum for the Future, which is still fundamentally the frame and the, the base that he now uses to influence a huge number of different organizations, both public and private, literally around the world. And, and some of them actually in pretty, uh, pretty much at the sharp end of a lot of the, the debates. Um, the airline industry, Palm Isle in Malaysia, all of those really, really hard problems that people need to address. And Jonathan just throws himself into to help and advise and try and get people through all of that. As a university, there is no doubt that we have learned an awful lot from Jonathan. And I hope that at various points in the last 10 years, at the very least, he's been at least a little bit proud of what we've achieved. But again, tonight is not the, net, the, net, the night for me to talk very much around that. As I say, we have learned a lot, and I'm sure as individuals, we've learned a lot. I certainly have. Um, and I'm sure we're going to learn an awful lot more this evening. So I'm not gonna say any more because you've come to hear Jonathan. So Jonathan, welcome this evening. It's great to see you here. And so I now present Jonathan Porritt who's gonna give his lecture 10 years on looking back to leap forward. Jonathan. Thank you. Um, yes, and wonderful to be here this week to go through what are such incredibly important moments in our students' lives. It is every time a bit humbling, to be honest, to be standing there and thinking about that moment in their lives. 
and how they will be hoping to take everything they've achieved here, whatever it might be, their degrees and more, out into the big wide world to make sure that the world will be a better place. It's our kind of overarching imperative, as you know, that our students shouldn't just get their degrees, but they should be prepared for a world which needs an awful lot of engagement from young people to make it a, a better place. And I guess in that regard, looking back over 10 years, all I can tell you personally is that it is a great deal harder to be standing in front of those young people today than it was 10 years ago. And I really wish I didn't have to say that. I really, I really, really wish I could say that so much had happened in the last 10 years, that when we're doing our graduating, giving our graduation speech, that we sort of feel that each decade has allowed us to build into their prospects a greater sense of authentic hope for what their future will be about. But I was reflecting on that this afternoon. I was doing my first ceremony this afternoon and thinking about the 10 years. And honestly, I thought, well, okay, it's a bit difficult to recall exactly what I was feeling 10 years ago, obviously. My memory certainly isn't that good. But I do sort of remember thinking that there was no reason why the next decade, 2012 through to 2020, shouldn't be a decade in which we used all the amazing science and knowledge that had become available over the previous 20 years. Why well, we shouldn't have used that to begin to transform our society and our economy. I, there wasn't any reason for me in 2012 to think that wasn't a very real possibility for the future. Now, maybe I was a little bit more wary than a lot of people at that time. I'd been chair of the Sustainable Development Commission up until 2010, and I was more than a little unnerved when the incoming Conservative and Lib Dem government decided that they didn't need the Sustainable Development Commission anymore, and so axed it. Very quickly indeed, on the somewhat spurious basis that sustainable development now mattered so much to the new government that they didn't need a separate advisory body. You've probably heard that before. This matters to us so much that we're going to mainstream it across the entire organization. That does mean to say that our specialist capability will have to be axed, but hey, that's the price you pay for mainstreaming. So I was really a little bit nervous in 2012 about the degree to which this agenda was going to be taken forward as dynamically as it needed to be. I was a little bit nervous about some of the early attitudes to things, for instance, like the zero carbon built environment. For those of you who have good sound memories, you may remember 10 years ago, we could all depend on something called the Code for Sustainable Homes to be brought in by the previous government. It was much admired outside of this country as a really sensible way to give the industry clarity as to what would be asked of them with various step changes kicking in over the next decade, funnily enough. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Code for Sustainable Homes got axed, along with a lot of other things like that. And you just need, we just need to reflect on the irony of this, because had we stuck with the Code for Sustainable Homes, which I can assure you had taken a lot to persuade the wretched volume house builders was going to be good for them as well as good for the country and good for everybody who'd be buying a sustainable home over the course of the next decade. Had we stuck with the code for sustainable homes, every single new home in this country today would be a zero carbon home. Every single new home. That's pretty shocking. That's pretty shocking. Because once you've done all the hard work and the heavy lifting on difficult policy, boy, you just want to stick with it. Once you've got it over the line, 
Get behind it. Make it work. By contrast, because obviously tonight I'm going to be balancing hope and despair at every moment, because I'm always very conscious of the psychological well-being of audiences with whom I'm spending time these days. There might be a little bit more on the despair side tonight than the hope side, but on the hope side, back in 2012, nobody really thought that the renewables industry here in the UK was going to absolutely take off. Indeed, the principal scientific advisor in what was then called DEC, the Department for Energy and Climate Change, now embodied in Bayes, don't worry about these acronyms, they all sort of roughly mean the same, was a very wonderful guy, a man called Sir David Mackay, an extremely eminent uh, scientist, wrote a brilliant book about climate change without the hot air, nice title, I like titles, and he was the principal advisor to ministers in deck and we were all a little bit worried about this because David Mackay, brilliant brain though he was, had a complete blind spot about renewable electricity. Total blind spot. He was a pro-nuclear enthusiast and once you're a pro-nuclear enthusiast by and large blindness comes with the, with the ticket. <laughs> he was totally blind to what renewables could do and he described the very notion that renewable electricity could actually underpin the whole of the UK's future prosperity as, and here I quote, an appalling delusion. Now, David died very sadly in 2016. But even so, back in 2012, he was actively advising ministers that they should not be worrying themselves with this piddling little solar and wind and biomass and tidal story because it was never going to deliver the goods. Well, I'm happy to say that ministers in that government and since then chose not to listen to that advice, really began to do some very smart policy making around renewable energy, so much so that now here in 2022 in the UK we get more than 45% of our electricity from renewables from appalling delusion to, by the end of this year, more than 50% of our electricity. By the end of this decade, by 2030, that'll be up to at least 70%. And by 2035, we should be up to 85, 90% of our electricity from renewables. And that's because ministers at the time said, well, okay, we know this is a hot button topic, but frankly, this looks good. And it looks good in part because we can invest in it. We can create jobs here for people in this country. And energy, that electricity that comes from those technologies will be all ours. <coughs> It'll enhance our energy security. And back in 2012, I can assure you, people weren't thinking very much about energy security. They thought that all of these different sources of energy could be globally traded, because that was the way in which the economy worked. And it didn't really matter where the oil came from, the gas came from, or anything else, because the market would sort it out. So hats off to people who have recognized the importance of energy security, often at times when the, the grain of political acumen was working against that kind of, of insight. So it's a funny old story when you look back on these things. And for me, it's a really important reminder that stuff goes off in all sorts of different unexpected directions, which is very, very hard to anticipate, let alone to predict. And this renewables revolution, by the way, is utterly astonishing. And I do use the word revolution advisedly because what is going on in the world today is completely remarkable as the cost of these technologies continues to fall, even now, after more than 15 years of year-on-year -year reduction in cost of about seven to eight percent, the costs are still coming down. Efficiencies are still increasing. There's a whole pipeline of new innovation about these technologies coming forward, which means they are already outcompeting all other sources of electricity pretty much everywhere in the world. 
and certainly at the moment, for reasons we know. That's astonishing. It's astonishing. And that applies just as much to a country like India, where whatever one might think about Prime Minister Modi and his excessive enthusiasm for coal, also has an incredibly soft spot for solar. Because he realized it's an out and out vote winner for many, many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people in India who are not connected to the grid. And if they are connected with the grid, guess what? The grid often doesn't deliver the electrons in the way the grid is meant to deliver the electrons. For those off-grid rural communities, solar is brilliant and relatively cheap and getting cheaper. So there is literally no part of the world that won't be benefiting from this revolution. It's an extraordinary thing. I still don't think people really understand just how big a thing this is. We could actually be done with our use of fossil fuels and our use of nuclear for electricity, not for all other energy purposes, but just for electricity. We could be done with that <laughs> if we really wanted by the end of this decade. If we treated the climate emergency with the same degree of attention and urgency that we've come to treat the coronavirus emergency, the pandemic. And of course we don't. We, these two things are treated in completely different ways. So upsides and downsides in that, in that story. The bit I have to share with you, however, tonight is just a little reminder of how seriously bad the unfolding science has become over 10 years. And that's again because it's quite hard to find out about these things. You know, the last report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, so that's the body that advises governments and everybody, basically. The final report of Working Group 3, as it's called, came out just at the time of the Ukraine war. And of course, it emerged, it flared as a kind of one-off story very, very quickly. The next day, it was completely gone, literally completely gone. You couldn't read an, another article about it or hear an interview about it. It was just gone completely. So I'm just going to unwrap for you what has happened between these two massively important reports. They're called the assessment reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And the last one came out in 2014, so not quite a decade, but near enough. And this one has come out in 2022, so an eight-year gap. And these reports are astonishing because what they do is to reflect all the published and peer-reviewed science in a preceding window of time leading up to that publication moment. It's not completely on top of it, so everything in the 2022 assessment report actually is reflecting the science as it was brought to a conclusion. Because you have to set a cutoff point so that you can do this with the kind of rigor that these scientists expect up until the end of 2020. So everything in the 2022 report is already 15 months, 18 months out of date, which is significant as I'll come on to explain. But nonetheless, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary science process that the world created to help us get on top of this emerging problem. Set up in 1988, there's never been a scientific process of this kind ever before on any other subject and I very much doubt there will be again. So, 2014 to 2022, uh, every single one of the principal indicators about whether we've got any expectation of arriving in what is called a safe operating space for humankind by 2050 or the end of the century has gone in the wrong direction. That's it, I've done the comparison for you. You don't need to read the advice for policymakers, let alone all 500 pages of the report. It is a bit of a nightmare. Literally, every single one of the principal indicators. There is no countervailing data set that tells us, oh, well, it might be really, really bad over there, but it's kind of much better over here. And so if you balance the one against the other, yes, it's still bad, but it's not that bad. There's literally no 
countervailing data set whatsoever. And of course, scientists look at that and they just say, okay, that's when you connect the dots between all of these very different data sets, and they're looking at everything around the world. Just to remind you, this isn't about computer models, by the way. This is about real measured impacts on existing planetary and ecosystems. When you join up the dots of all of that, it tells us just how bad it is. Back in 2014, this is before the big Paris conference in 2015, the expectation was that we were heading towards something like a 3.5 degrees centigrade average temperature change by the end of the century, and that would be really, really bad. But if the politicians got their act together, we might be able to bring that back down to a two degree centigrade average change by the end of the century. And then, of course, in Paris, in a wonderful mad moment of kind of manic last ditch diplomacy, where all of those small island states pointed out to the gathered world leaders that if the best they could do was two degrees centigrade by the end of the century, they would all be dead because all of their islands would have disappeared. So right at the last moment, you hardly ever get drama like this in international UN conferences. They're kind of designed to avoid stuff like this. But right at the last moment, those decision makers built in this commitment to do everything that we could to restrict the temperature increase to no more than 1.5 degrees centigrade. Because then we'd have a 50% chance of not drowning, drowning all of those islands. And that was considered to be a fantastically important breakthrough, and so it was. The report that came out three weeks ago Working Group 3 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's sixth assessment report said, you can pretty much forget 1.5 degrees centigrade. It's gone. And you'll probably recall in November, at COP26 in Glasgow, we were all being exhorted day by day, practically hour by hour, to keep 1.5 alive. This was the whole thrust of COP26, that we should do everything we can. Then just four months later, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says, yep, well, okay, that's good, but honestly, what we would have to do now to restrict the average temperature increase to no more than 1.5 by the end of the century is so unbelievably dramatic, transformative, that our view is, even though we're scientists, our view is it ain't gonna happen. Happily, at the same time, a really important paper in Nature was published saying, yep, we agree with that, but we still have a chance to ensure the temperature increase does not exceed two degrees centigrade by the end of the century. So we're back to the two degrees centigrade. Forget all of those small island states, gone. But hey, we should still be all right for the whole, most of humanity, as it were. So now, all the rhetoric will pivot. We'll go back to what do we need to do to maintain no more than a two degrees centigrade temperature increase by the end of the century. What needs to happen? So, and I'm sure there are people sitting out saying, oh, for God's sake, what's he going on about? What's the difference between 1.5 and 2? Because I know this, I've experienced this, because people who turn up their thermostats, often by two to three degrees, when the weather gets really cold, before the price hikes, think to themselves, yeah, come on, that's nothing. So just one statistic to remind you about this. At 1.5 degrees centigrade increase, the IPCC tells us that roughly 90% of the world's reefs will disappear, coral reefs will disappear. At two degrees, just a 0.5 degree centigrade increase, 100% will disappear by the end of this century. So it's no small thing to watch a target that admittedly was only in our midst for about seven years just disappear because we've done so little of what we should have done to accelerate the phasing out of our use of fossil fuels, to accelerate new patterns of land use and so on and so forth. 
And that is, that is genuinely disheartening. And I cannot gloss this little story for you just because it's my last lecture as Chancellor of Kiel. And you probably all want me to be standing here radiantly upbeat about the future of humankind on this planet. I cannot do it when we do not have the supporting evidence to justify such utterly facile optimism. I cannot do it. And just one last little reminder about why I cannot do it, and I want you now to think of yourselves as if you were all a graduating student today. However long ago, a couple here, maybe, I don't know. However long ago it may be that you graduated, just take your mind, if you did, sorry, then take your mind back to the age when you might have graduated, and just remember what you were feeling like at that time. And now think about yourself at the age of 20, 21, and now imagine that you are prospecting out into this uncertain future of yours through to the end of this century. A lot of those kids in the marquee today will still be alive in 2100 because average longevity, whatever else is going on in the world, unbelievably, average longevity continues to increase. So a lot of them will be around in 2100. And should they be so ill-advised as to read the text of the Intergovernmental Panel's report, they will find some completely chilling information about where sea level rise will be by 2100. So back in 2014, the IPCC were worried about sea level rise. They're not that worried. They were projecting at that time that there might be a 35 to 50 centimeter increase in sea level rise by the end of the century. So bad, trust me, that's bad, but not that bad. And their worst case in 2014 was a meter. That's really bad. Jump forward eight years. The most optimistic projection for average sea level rise by 2100 is a meter. That is now literally, in the eyes of the IPCC, literally unavoidable because of the warming we've put into the atmosphere. And their worst case, just eight years after they told us that a meter was the worst case, their worst case scenario is two meters. Now, you're a 20-year-old sitting there in a graduation ceremony thinking to yourself, yeah, well, it's a bit tough out there at the moment. We're not certain about what's going on. Cost of living increase, pandemic, war in Ukraine, still likely to be living at home for the next 40 years. I really can't see where my life is going. And now you tell me that I'm gonna be living underwater. I joke a bit, but I don't know why. Because this is just utterly unbelievable that we have allowed this to happen. We have allowed this to happen. So best case, a meter. Worst case, two meters. Okay. That's another really, really, really gloomy stuff. Because it gets difficult to live with all of this. It's not an easy thing to be in the science community, the climate science community today, let alone to be an interpreter of that science. I'm not a scientist myself. I follow the science very carefully because it does slightly preoccupy me. It's not an easy thing to do, psychologically, to be in the middle of this and to understand the impact that this is going to have on people's lives now throughout the rest of this century. We don't suddenly go from where we are now to a two meter sea level rise by the end of the century. It happens slowly over time. And the lives of billions of people will be very severely affected. So learning to live with this, learning what this means for us as individuals, as citizens on this planet becomes more and more important. And although I didn't go into it today in my graduation speech, you probably do all know that the phenomenon of what is sometimes called eco-angst or climate angst is now much more prevalent amongst young people than it's ever been. And there were we today graduating those students in mental health. And of course, a little bit of my brain is whirring, saying, oh, okay, so you know, don't you, that in your practice, 
your mental health practice, whatever it might be, you will be encountering more and more young people who are feeling this pressure on them as young citizens on this planet. Yeah, so, what can I say now? I want you to go back again to 2012, because we were already beginning to see in 2012 all sorts of encouraging signals about how we might eventually get on top of this once this deep understanding of the climate emergency had actually landed. We were beginning to see, for instance, back in 2012, how the business community was being much, much more prescient about the impact of climate change on their businesses, on their supply chains, on their prospects to make profit. Let's be honest about it. If you're a for-profit entity in the world today, in today's market economy, of course you're focused on what it is that is going to make it possible for you to go on making profit over the rest of your company's lifetime, however many decades that might be. And the business community then were just beginning, but quite deep into, an understanding of what they would need to do. The investment community in 2012 had just woken up to the risk that climate change posed to their investments and how important it would be for them to start reflecting this. And if you go back for that time, for those 10 years, bit by bit, more companies, more investors have got on the right page and are now so far ahead of most governments as to make it even more embarrassing for our politicians. Okay, we're lucky in Forum for the Future. We are lucky. We work with amazingly progressive companies. They are all of them trying to wrestle with this stuff and with some of these big social issues around human rights and living wage and so on. It's all the time, all the time trying to process, process what to do about this. So I know that the companies we work with are not necessarily representative of the whole of the corporate world, as it were. But when I listened to these business leaders, and I was in Cambridge last night with the latest seminar, 45 business leaders brought together by the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, and you know, they were just sitting there looking as bewildered as I am about why we're not making more progress given that we actually do know what we ought to be doing. Just not understanding it. I kept saying, we could be doing so much more. But if you ask them all to do it voluntarily, even if their competitors aren't doing it, then that gets very tricky. So you have to change the rules of the game. So for me, one of the real upbeat stories of the last decade has been the degree to which business leaders around the world have genuinely stepped into some of that space. And now increasingly behind them, we're beginning to see investors as well. And I take heart from that because we need that. We need those wealth creators to be on the side of a very different paradigm of what economic prosperity actually looks like. It's true. There are many environmentalists who do not subscribe to the view that I've just shared with you, who basically think that the whole for-profit global economy is in itself the source of the problem the scourge of all of these terrible environmental issues that we're looking at, and would have no truck with the idea that business could be part of the leadership that we need to bring us out of this impasse. Okay, I get it. I can see where that part of the environment movement is coming from, but unless they've got some extraordinarily very large magic wand to wave, which will make all large multinational companies disappear overnight to be replaced by unbelievably intelligent, benign, compassionate, caring, social enterprises who would never do anything bad to the planet, to an employee, to their community, unless they've got a magic wand as big as that. This is the economy we've got to make work. This is our reality. We've still got to make that work. So I take heart from that, and that continues, to be honest, all the time. So let me now just wind this up. I, I caused a little bit of a stir at Kiel when I became chancellor. Happily, you allowed me to create a bit of a stir. Thank you very much, collectively speaking. 
because I questioned the degree to which higher education was fit for purpose to help young people navigate this difficult world. The 10 years has persuaded me that individual higher and further education institutions can do an amazing amount. And I will, like you, Trevor, be saying a bit more about this tomorrow. I have been hugely proud about what Kiel has been able to do to address these challenges. It really has meant a massive amount to me, personally, to see how a university can step up and do all, all of the things that it really needs to do. And there's so much that you don't, you don't actually hear about. For instance, I really do wonder how many of you know here that Kiel won an award recently for being a hedgehog-friendly campus. <laughs> you see? You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> I bet you didn't. I read that, I thought, I love little things like that. You know, that's, that's, by the way, a very, very tiny part of what is going on here on the campus. And of course, on Wednesday, we will have a big moment in the history of the university as the low carbon electricity generator is officially opened after years of work by colleagues here at Kiel to persuade planners and local communities, I won't say more than that, that this is a truly sensible thing to do if you're a university like we are with the asset of a lot of land to use effectively. And that generating asset will produce 50% of our electricity. That's huge. So this has been a big, this has been really important for me because it's allowed me to think, yeah, you know what? Higher education could be on the side of the angels. Instead of lurking around, not really doing very much one way or the other, almost as if they were observing as the planet begins to implode and thinking that they didn't have any particular role to play. And I've got to say from an HE perspective, generally, the story here in the UK is very mixed. And you always know when people use the phrase very mixed, that's a euphemism for really, really bad. <laughs> so by the end of this year, if we're lucky, no less than, fewer than half of the universities in this country will meet the already totally inadequate target that they set for reducing emissions by 2020, extended through to 2022 because of the pandemic on a 2018 ba baseline. Only, at best, half will actually manage to meet that pathetic target. The thing that caused a stir when I gave my lecture when I was being installed, someone said to me, like a computer program, <laughs> I hope I've avoided that risk, was to suggest that universities had a very particular and special responsibility that no other part of society had, HE and FE together. Because we have the privilege of knowledge, what I've shared with you this evening is available to every single person who cares about the future of humankind on earth, and coupled with the knowledge, we have the responsibility for young people under our care on our campus for the length of time that they're here in loco parentis or call it what you will. And I suggested at that time that if you now thought about the implications of accelerating climate change, it posed what a lot of people now accept. It posed an existential risk to the future of humankind. Existential, as in threatening the very existence, or certainly the existence of societies we know it today, at some point in the future. No climate scientists I know today, 10 years on, would differ from that judgment. Not one. They would all acknowledge that because we've done so little, not just over the last 10 years, but the last 20, 30 years, that we now have created this existential risk for the whole of humankind. 
That's what we've done on our watch. And I went on from there, this was with Trevor's predecessor, with Nick Foskett, to suggest that meant we at Kiel had a very particular responsibility to ensure that no student could possibly enjoy an educational experience here at Kiel without being supercharged with the knowledge that he or she would need to be able to cope with a world in which we would be heading into this kind of dangerous territory. Now, again, Kiel has made some real progress on that, particularly around curriculum integration and things like that. But we haven't met that yet, Trevor. We haven't got to the point where any of us here at this university could feel comfortable that every single student was not only equipped to understand the world as it is, but given the resources to be an effective agent of change in that world. The responsibilities of knowledge for anybody working in a university context are enormous. So I feel that still. It's wonderful that Kiel is recognized now as the sustainability institution of the year from 2021 globally. It's an astonishing thing for a university to be recognized in that way. But I know that all of my colleagues here at Kiel still recognize there is a huge amount that we have to do to ensure that the students on our watch during their time here can understand the nature of the predicament that we're all in and be empowered more effectively to address it. And we've got more to do in that regard. So I wish my successor well, as I hope not too much of a activist chancellor this time around, Trevor, but I do wish my successor well as he takes on that part of the challenge as well, because it's a really important part of it. And I say that because the final thing that I want you just to bear in mind is what is the thing that has made me most hopeful over the last 10 years? The bit that has really cut through a lot of this ah, gathering science-based gloom and doom, the thing that has made me more hopeful than anything else is the emergence in our lives, particularly in the climate movement, but also in many other social movements today of young people. And it is really difficult to cast your mind back, even as far as 2018, because, oh my God, it's been such an utter nightmare over the last two years with COVID. But if you go back to 2018 and the emergence of Extinction Rebellion, the emergence of young people's climate activist initiatives of one kind or another, Strikes for Friday and so on, and you go back to that incredible inspirational leadership offered to us all from Greta Thunberg, this has created a different way of thinking about what activism for the future will look like. I'm being completely honest here. Much of that was crushed as a consequence of COVID. I spend quite a bit of time with young climate activists in my work today. I feel it's a really important bit of my contribution now to what this movement can offer. And I saw the contrast between 2019 and the end of 2019 when there were 7 million young people on the streets of cities all around the world essentially acting as one to bring these concerns to the attention of their adult leaders. Between the end of 2019 and where we are now in 2022, it has been shocking to see how hard it's been for young people to sustain their activism. It's not they've gone away, it's not they're any the less concerned, compassionate, angry, worried, fearful, None of that entire gamut of emotional responses has disappeared. It's just that COVID completely knocked the stuffing out of how young people could build their climate activism. So one of the things I want to make sure I leave you with tonight is to understand what we now need to do to allow young people again to be that incredibly energized refreshing, inspirational, radical voice in our midst.
to recapture some of that energy from 2019 and help young people bring it forward again, however uncomfortable it might be for older people, to bring it forward again to help persuade us to do more than we've been able to do so far. All, I guess, captured by one of Greta Thunberg's many quotes. She's so quotable, that young woman. Honestly, it's embarrassing for those who labor away to be quotable even every now and then. She's just amazing how she goes to the heart of this stuff, but the one that sticks in my mind when she's often surrounded by world leaders who are sort of, on the one hand, acknowledging her incredible leadership, but on the other hand, doing nothing. And her reminder was, all of you now have to act as if our house was on fire, because it is. We need to stick with that kind of piercing truth, because otherwise we get lost in the thickets of polite language in which nothing ever really moves forward. So for me, not through Kiel, I'm sorry to say, but through whatever opportunities I've got to work with young people from this point on, I will now be lending far more, as much as possible, of my time and passion to help young people help us. Because boy, do we need it. Right, that's me lot. I <laughs> I'd like to thank you, Jonathan, for a typically thoughtful, thought-provoking, challenging lecture. I was reflecting over the weekend, it's probably 35 years since I first heard you speak. Uh, obviously, I was still at infant school at the time, but, uh, when, you, when you were uh, Director of Friends of, of the Earth. I'm not going to say any more because we've got about 15 minutes for question and answer session. So we've got, Zoe's got roving microphones, so if anybody's got a question, uh, can you keep them reasonably concise and then Jonathan, I'm sure, will then answer them. Okay, front to there. I'll go to the I can think 35 years. I think I was a friend of the earth in the, uh, in the 80s, actually, yeah. before, before I became a student. And I come to Kiel twice a year for the last decade, twice a week, sorry, for the last 10 years. And I've seen what's gone on and I love the place, the architecture, the cherry blossom and, and the new projects at the end of the business park. My query is really, in simple terms, because if I recall, you said we're on 40 to 50% renewable now as a nation, and that should nearly double 80 odd percent in 13 more years. How, how will the gap be made cloaked most of the time when some of those main provisions aren't available to us? <laughs> oh, yes. We could be doing this so much more easily than we will be doing it. Um, most of the heavy lifting will be offshore wind, is, is the simplest answer I can give you. And um, the government's just increased the target for offshore wind from 30 gigawatts to 40 gigawatts. So that's a shed load of offshore wind to an even bigger shed load of offshore wind. Actually, the pipeline for offshore wind around the UK shores is twice that. 80 gigawatts of offshore wind. That pretty much meets all our electricity demand in itself. Now, we probably won't get that all built, to be honest, because it still takes time. I mean, it's no thing, no mean thing getting out there and erecting these vast, enormous turbines, as you know. I mean, they are astonishing to look at these. And of course, we've got the new technology now, which is the floating wind turbine, which is, has now been pioneered three different floating wind turbine arrays already here in the UK. I shouldn't call them arrays. There are only one or two turbine prototypes. But these will allow turbines to get even bigger to push on up beyond 16 megawatts. These are vast, vast industrial structures in themselves. So that's where we'll go to to start with. <coughs> Solar is a really big technology now in the UK. You probably don't want to go much further north than Yorkshire, really, when it comes to solar. But nonetheless, it's already providing 
a very significant percentage of our total electricity, and we could be getting a lot more from that. People are getting a bit nervous about large-scale ground-mounted solar in rural areas. There's a bit of a pushback, if I can put it like that. And, of course, and I will be frank with you here, we have got a rear-guard bunch of recidivist NIMBYs who think that onshore wind is the most evil thing in the world today, <laughs> probably including Putin. <laughs> and for me, this is insane. I'm sorry, this is insane. I've, got, I've completely run out of patience. In the past, I used to be occasionally polite about this, but I can't, I'm too old now to bother with politeness. Onshore wind, done well, in the right place, with the backing and support of communities who are allowed to be beneficiaries of those onshore wind farms. That's the critical thing, that they get to be beneficiaries, either in terms of reduced bills, whatever it might be, is the cheapest way of adding new electricity to the grid here in the UK. The cheapest, by a long way. I mean, offshore wind is uh, amazing, but it's a tough engineering challenge to get your turbines built out at sea. Onshore? Uh, so if we really wanted to go for this, we'd do all of that. We'd do onshore, we'd do offshore, we'd do solar, and then guess what? We'd round all of that out by a massive great barrage on the seven, which would produce between seven and eight percent of our total electricity needs for at least the next 100 years so much more cheaply than any of those nuclear white elephants that Boris is now getting his rocks off on, <laughs> that you can hardly believe it. Please don't ask me about nuclear power, because honestly, it'll just spoil the mood. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Tom. I, I mean, I can speak without it, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll just get my notes up because... Uh-oh. Uh <laughs> it's one of those. Uh, so you talked about supercharging our students for the future. And I find it really inspiring as being an environment and sustainable degree graduate, um, as well as sitting here with a couple other students who studied in the GG. Um, at Kiel, we do focus a lot on sustainability. Um, as it's one of our core values. However, over time, our students have been desensitized to sustainability in the environment, especially our environmental needs as a planet. And students no longer engage with the events, activities, campaigns, um, youth strikes for climate, for example, in the local community, no longer, especially after the pandemic. We change our system within the university and it is looking very promising, uh, especially with the solar array and the turbines that we have put in place. We change the system that students live in on campus, um, and they live sustainably through those system change that we make. However, student minds aren't changing. So I want to ask you, how do we change student minds, if it's important, with our system changes as well? If not, then that's fine. But is system change all we need, or do we also need to change the minds of our students? And how do we do that? <laughs> this, by the way, is a deep philosophical question. <laughs> I mean it, because it goes right to the heart of, of personal responsibility. And what you're suggesting is that the one hand, actually we could sort everything out for for students, we could just do it. And they wouldn't know that it was all being done on their behalf and all the buildings would be super efficient and all our electricity would be super renewable and food would be super sustainable and you wouldn't be able to see a bit of beef anywhere in a five mile radius. And we'd do all of that stuff on their behalf and they could come in and three years later they'd go out and they wouldn't know that they'd had a completely sustainable experience in their three years at Kiel. Question, as you put it, is that a good thing? Surely we need to have young people not just being beneficiaries of somebody else's ability to change the system, but we need young people themselves to be sharing that challenge. And 
owning what that means for them personally. So that's where I came in on this particularly controversial suggestion at the start of my tenure, which you'll notice I'm now so much less controversial that I haven't even mentioned it, which is that every single student coming into Kiel should have at least a one day induction process, at least one day, deep immersion in what I've just skimmed over in half an hour. Deep, deep immersion. So that every young person coming onto this campus understands what the future is about. I've only touched on climate change. I haven't even mentioned the ecological emergency, you will have noticed, which probably needs a bit of deep immersion too. Because only if you allow young people to have access to these insights, to this astonishingly brilliant science, only then are you likely to get enough students to say, okay, got it. <laughs> I'm really pleased to be here at Kiel because I, I see now we can work together. Students, the student body, the university, people responsible for the campus, we can work together to make this a, such an exciting place of transformation. So that is still my, my outgoing bid for what leadership would look like now in a university. There are four universities now, by the way, in the UK that do offer, uh, that do provide compulsory climate induction as part of their onboarding process. So every student, it's usually only about an hour, so I'm obviously much more greedy than that. I want a whole day at least. And I want them to see the upside. Everybody should go and have a look at our wind farm, our solar farm, everybody. And they say, okay, that looks pretty amazing. Brilliant, we've got it here. And what does that mean for us now? So that's my take on it. And I'm, uh, it's better than nothing that somebody changes the system on behalf of all young people today, but it's not as good as young people being part of that and then helping us to change the rest of the system, which we're still completely failing to touch. Um, I'm kind of channeling Charlie Ledbetter's living, with, living on thin air here, but I was wondering how much and how do we persuade everybody on the planet including ourselves, that the fruits of becoming a richer society, better technology and everything, have to be geared towards not consuming more stuff, not having bigger houses, not having everybody having a car, but to actually spend those riches on things that are energy low, like going to see a band or having fun in the park. That'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I honestly, so much depends on that. When I joined the Green Party in 1974, the thing, the one thing, there were so many things that I was really fascinated by. And one of them back in 1974 was no political party should base its prospects of success on permanent economic growth. Because once we, associate our model of progress with compulsory increases in economic growth year on year on year, we're kind of signing a deal with the devil here. Because it's impossible, it is impossible to generate that economic growth without continuing to do damage to the planet and increasingly to do damage to other people elsewhere who contribute to our economic growth in the rich world. We can have less damaging economic growth, oh, trust me, a lot less damaging than the economic growth we have today. But at the end of this entire period of industrial civilization, we will have to come to the terms with the fact that 10 billion people, which is what our population will be by 2050, that 10 billion people cannot possibly live with the kind of material living standards that we have today. It is not physically possible. So the nature of the challenge here, which you're touching on, is how do we work with people to help make that happen? So for me, it, this isn't just about what happens at the national level. This is about local engagement and empowerment. I'm very proud to be associated with Climate Matters Staffordshire here, because it's one of the ways in which people can be given access to 
some understanding about what it means for their own lifestyles. And we have to start at that level. We have to begin to get people to see it. But don't despair about this. I read a thing two weeks ago about how, even though the government refuses to do anything about dealing with, with diet, looking at, at the near insanity of our meat-intensive diets, um, on the, for fear of the Daily Mail instantly beating them up as a kind of bunch of nanny state anti-meat activists, and you know how much they all quiver with fear at the thought of the Daily Mail biting their jugular. Um, even though the government's doing literally nothing, Boris Johnson actually specifically said, we're gonna do all this, we're gonna be net zero by 2050, and we're not gonna ask anyone to change their lifestyle at all. That was one of his more preposterous quotes at Glasgow. And there were quite a few. Um, that was before he took the helicopter back to London after. <laughs> um, but uh, this piece I read is young people today. It is happening. This is a process that's already going forward. More and more people are not overnight becoming vegetarians or vegans, but they are reducing the meat, amount of meat that they eat every week, and they are choosing to do this quite sensibly, because guess what, at the same time, the quality of plant-based alternatives to meat, as well as vegetarian and vegan meals, is improving all the time. So if you look at the pattern of meat consumption in young people today, it continues to get better and better, not by a vast amount every year, but it is changing all the time. So for me, what government should be doing is nudging, I kind of don't really like that notion, but given that they won't do anything sensible about this, they should at least be nudging people to make it easier. And that would mean addressing some of the mad nutritional dysfunctionalities in our society today, where it costs so much more to buy fresh fruit and veg than it does to go and buy absolute rubbish at some fast food outlet. If we started to think about those shifts towards a different way of looking at nutrition, it would help a lot. So don't despair. People come, come at these points of awareness from all sorts of different places. And I'm relatively hopeful. I'm genuinely very hopeful on the meat front uh, because this is all happening without there being a kind of concerted political action behind it. Um. I'd just like to say something that I kept a very interesting young man I met. Um, we are, I'm, I'm the chair of Climate Matters, and we were working on a green banner made out of recycled materials in Newcastle. And amongst the groups he worked with were a group of unaccompanied asylum seekers. I met a young man from Kurdistan. He had had two years of education. He wouldn't join in the actual production of the banner, but we were also doing some leaves and writing on them. He said, I can't write properly, but we sat and talked about it. I said, I'll write it on a bit of paper. We'll discuss it until we've got exactly what you said. And what he said was, until we have peace in the world and we all work together and respect each other, only then will we be able to save planet Earth. And he was just a remarkable man. He arrived, he was aged nearly 19, he'd arrived here under a lorry. And yet he had the wisdom that most of us lack. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Yes, it's particularly daunting to think about that in terms of where we are now with Russia and Ukraine. And of course all of this just makes our challenge so much bigger. I mean, you could see how quickly it happened. Within, within 24 hours of the outbreak of war, much of these concerns that were passed over from COP26 at the end of the year just disappeared, and it's another reason to push it onto the back burner. So the peace story is, is a really big one. Really, it's a huge part of it. Huge part of it. Okay, three more questions. Bill, and then two over. Why don't we take them all together, we will do and that. then I will. Composite, my <laughs> <laughs> That's a shock to the system. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, there's quite a few people from uh, Kiel World Affairs here. So thank you for uh, your support to us as well as to the university during the last 10 years. And of course, uh, they're also aware that uh, you've helped us enormously on the advisory panel. 
by bringing other minds to discuss this huge subject of sustainability and uh, from our point of view long may that continue after your chancellorship here so thank you so much I'd just like to add to this uh, question of uh, intergenerational view you made me think how long ago I graduated and uh, Okay, now I'm getting a bit older, I don't want to jump on aeroplanes as much, I don't want so many foreign holidays, but I'm wondering whether these, young, these younger generations who are being stimulated in the way you've described uh, will fall victim to the desires of consumption uh, that I've experienced during my lifetime. So how, to what extent do you think uh, we can persuade people to give up holidays, for example, uh, to go to foreign countries to learn about other cultures, etc., etc. All the things that we were told were good for us, good for our soul, uh, and good for the world. Giving up holidays. Sorry, no, no. Let's just get the other two quick. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't see how you can give a lecture like this without recognising that the. The true situation has been known for over 30 years. I was on Staffordshire County Council. We were told this was happening after Rio and various things like that. And why has nothing basically been done by anybody to sort anything out? And the answer is very clear. In, in, in the minds of the energy industry, of the coal and the oil and the gas, they just saw this as a threat. They spent billions on influencers who've just cast doubt on the science. Why are they not sort of given the treatment? Why are they not even sort of, uh, a tax will not even be imposed on them for the excess profits they're making? They live a charmed life. But they are responsible for this failure that all of us, I'm afraid, just feel that uh, is, is, is our, our legacy to the world. Thank you. Well, my, my young person's rail card expired during the pandemic. I never got a last chance to use it, but it means I am technically a recently young person. No, a, re I, a recently old person. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Yes, just jo join the ranks. But I think for people my age, who were recently young people, it's, it's really challenging to understand how to stay positive, because for people who have thinking about your graduation exam, I graduated in 2010, which was the year the coalition government came in, and people of my age have had a really dismal decade, really struggled. There has been all the things you know about stagnant wages, difficulty buying a house, difficulty back in 2010 getting, getting a job, even getting a good job, not a guarantee of being able to pay your rent, being able now to pay your, your fuel bills. Lots of the people I know who I'm friends with, graduated when I did, went to school with me, are very unhappy, despondent. And most of the people I know are being kept going, <laughs> either by watching a lot of Netflix, and it's the only way to cheer themselves up, or on a diet, frankly, of citalopram, sertraline, um, beta blockers, drugs designed to make people feel happier about the lives they're living. Now, I used to be quite political, and a lot of my friends did as well. But I'm not anymore, because I'm not so much angry as absolutely crushed and exhausted. And I don't think I'm, I'm unusual in that. And that flame for me and people like me has just died. There's no energy left to care about the things that clearly matter quite a lot. Now what I don't want to see is the next generation of people like me stop caring. <coughs> Nothing fundamentally has changed in the world. So how, and I'm hoping this will give you a chance to say something hopeful, even though I'm being quite negative. Quite. How, <laughs> <laughs> appropriately negative. How, how, do the, how do the people graduating today break the cycle? How do they make it so that they have a better future in their own lives, which allows them to keep the flame of activism alive? How do we do that? <laughs> Okay, whose bright idea was it to take three questions? <laughs> um, yeah. It's quite depressing hearing you talk like that because I recognize it, um, I recognize the pattern in many, many young people and 
And I sort of slightly skated over what the last decade has done to young people by looking at what the last three years has done to young climate activists, younger than you, still young people rather than old people now. Um, and I've seen this for myself. I've seen how the combination of many of these social and economic pressures have essentially knocked the stuffing out of whatever it is that is exciting and energizing for a lot of young people about better lives and better futures. So I'm very aware of that. Um, and I also, coming back to Bill's question, I don't want to romanticize about, about young people because actually there are a lot of young people who think that the way out of some of the difficulties that they've found over the last decade is to get out there and, and party like hell because, you know, if it's really all that bad, then maybe we should just double down on our parents' consumptive habits get even better at that than they were and have a real ball, even if it is gonna to have to be on half the budget, probably. Um, there are a lot of young people who don't give a stuff about this. Let's be absolutely honest. I'm, you know, I'm, not, I'm not in the business of romanticizing what young people can do and what some of them are minded to do because that's not gonna help anybody. But, I, you know, it's quite difficult for me to, to try and pull together an answer to your question, why has nobody done, ever, done anything, and yet have a, an imperative to give you a sort of reason, you a reason to be hopeful, because if you heard that gentleman's tirade, and quite appropriate tirade, you'd probably think, oh, sod it, that's it. I'm gonna carry on just as I've been doing for the last 10 years. So let me just try and cut through all of that, because I, I, I <laughs> Uh, you have to be able to cut through all of this. And the only way in which you can do it is to retain this realistic sense that ultimately we will understand why our obsession with this kind of highly damaging, destructive, growth-driven mania is destroying the lives of so many people today, or undermining their lives, or not providing them with the kind of meaning and the quality of life, which was your point that people have every right to expect. There will come a point where the realization that conventionally measured economic growth does not equal better lives for more than a tiny minority of people in our societies. That is the moment. That is the point when people say, oh, okay, that economic growth story that we had since the Second World War, it did improve the lives of hundreds of millions of people around the world. It really did. It genuinely improved the lives of a very large number of people here in the UK. If you go back to the 1970s and you see how people's lives were improved, you cannot retrospectively dismiss the benefit of that pattern of economic growth during that time. But now we've hit the buffers. And we've partly hit the buffers because of your analysis, sir, which is that we're stuck in the incumbency where the fossil fuel companies have got too many politicians in their pockets still and are able to manipulate them for as long as they can continue to get away with it. How much longer will that be? I don't know. Will that period end? Absolutely. Has it started to end? Yes, right now. Do young people think that it's going to end sooner rather than later? Yes, they do. So for me, it's, it's trying to juggle all of this stuff in your mind and understand the inevitability of there being quite profound change coming down the track, at which point I hope, sir, that your anger will actually stay angry. Don't stay angry. Boy, do we need anger. Um, and we're, we're, we have to go on being angry about those oil and gas companies. But their influence is waning. Look, seriously, last year, 2021, investment in renewable energy, I know I'm going to finish in a minute, Mark. Investment in renewable energy accounted for 89% of new investment in energy sources. 89% of all the billions of dollars that went into new energy generation in 2021. So only 11% went into oil and gas, actually about 10% went into oil and gas, and 1% went into stupid nuclear. <laughs> so, <laughs> this change is happening. This change is happening. You need to be alert to the fact that change is happening and not turn your minds away when it is happening because when you see it happening, then you need to double down on making it happen faster. 
So here's the very simple story I want you to think about being a politician today. God bless them and, and help them. Because it's like this. If you're a politician today, you've got one foot stuck in the past. That past was essentially run and managed by the big extractive companies. Fossil fuels, chemicals, mining, everything. Big, big industrial energy intensive stuff. And your political career pretty much depended on being in with the big boys. And you've got a foot in that camp. And now if you're a politician that's beginning to wrap his or her head around this stuff, you've got another foot in this very different world that is emerging in our midst. You know that cartoon where somebody's got a foot on the dock and another foot on the boat? And the boat is moving away from the dock and the legs of the poor unfortunate individual who's got a foot on the dock and a foot on the boat it's getting stretched and stretched and stretched, and they have to decide. Are they going to get on the boat? Are they going to jump back onto the dock? Or are they going to fall in the water? And I am always alert to the fact that more and more people are now getting on the boat. And people who are sticking with the incumbency are still very powerful and often very unpleasant not the kind of people you'd want to spend much time with, but we have got a new reality emerging in our midst. So that's what keeps me going. And 50 years on, I'm gonna keep the anger alive. I'm gonna keep on thinking about what this means. I'm gonna keep on taking holidays. Bill, I need my holidays. Don't start dissing holidays. If you want to bring people with you in this crusade, don't go around saying, nope, sorry, holidays are off the agenda now. We can't have any holidays. I think you were going to say no more foreign holidays or holidays abroad or quick holidays or carbon intensive holidays on planes. Look, you might even be allowed every now and then to get on a plane and have a fun holiday in Mallorca. I don't care, you know, whatever it might be. We shouldn't be too puritanical about this. There's still going to be tons of opportunities to have fun. I, look, really and truly. How weird that I should have to end this lecture by telling you one of the best ways you can help to become a climate activist is carry on having fun. Because if the rest of the world sees that as climate activists we're just a bunch of party pooping, miserable, depressed, sad people <laughs> who can't kind of cope with the prospects of the future, then why would you ever get on board that party? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm going to wrap this up quite quickly because we've got to take Jonathan for some plant-based food very shortly. Uh, I mean, as the Vice-Chancellor said, tomorrow night we will get the opportunity to thank Jonathan for his 11 years as, as Chancellor. And really, really this evening has been more a reflection of his nearly 50 years contributing hugely to the environmental and the ecological uh, movement, which is very much the reason why Kiel chose, chose him to be or approached him to be our, our Chancellor. I'm aware that a lot of people have come from outside tonight, so I'd really like to thank you for, for coming this evening and, and engaging with the lecture. Clearly it's a subject matter that can run and should run and run and it does need a lot of discussion. So thanks again Jonathan for a really thought-provoking and challenging lecture. Thank you. Thank you.